Well, good evening, my friends. Oh, we'll see who joins us first. Probably one of my three musketeers will be on here first. <laughs> so, waiting. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Oh, there's my first person. Welcome. Alta Gracia. Hi, how are ya? You doing good? Debbie's on here. Okay, so Debbie, you were my second one. I said, probably one of my three musketeers is going to be one of the first. So, um, hi Debbie, how are ya? July 10th is coming up. Angela's on here. Nice to see you, Angela. So, um, tonight, um, I'm going to be discussing a topic that isn't always the easiest to discuss because there's so much controversy controversy around it, but we're gonna try our best. Good, thank you. Good, Alta Gracia. So, you know what, while people are jumping on here, let me open with a word of prayer if that's okay. Okay. Oh dear Lord in heaven, we just come before you today and we just come right into the presence of God. You are a holy God, a righteous God, Lord, and Father, you have set your parameters for us. You're not a legalistic God, but you're a God that expects your people to um, live within the parameters that you've set down. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand that. And I pray, Father, for all of those that are watching tonight, um, those that um, is just going to the message tonight is just going to confirm what they already know, maybe give them a little bit more information that they can share with others and hold tight to maybe those that are confused and they're not really sure because their church hasn't really taught it and, and the world and a lot of their Christian friends um, have become kind of liberal in their thinking and they've kind of gotten away from scripture a little bit and so they're kind of confused and they don't really know that it's the ramifications to sexual impurity and everything. So, Lord, we just, um, all of those that are going to be watching either right now or later, we just ask, Lord, that you would um, go before me. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just anoint me with power and might as I talk and that, and that, the people that are listening, Father, that they're not hearing my voice, but they're hearing yours. Oh, Lord, you're such a great God, and we thank you and we praise you for being here with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we have more on here. Jan's on here. Hi, Jan. Renee is watching. Okay, so I'm just going to jump right in, okay, because... Um, so as you know, many of you know, um, I've been writing the, a Bible study on Revelation that I'm not going to teach until next fall, but you know, it's going to take a while to do it. And I know I keep saying that, but every time I do a lesson, God is just so using it in my life and really speaking to me and really speaking to me. And right now I'm still just writing, um, as you know, if you've read the book of Revelation, at the very beginning, Jesus gives seven churches warnings and admin um, warnings and also um, accolades for what they're doing. And so the other day I was writing, um, doing the portion of the Bible study that was on the church of at Thyatira in the second chapter of Revelation. And it really spoke to me a lot because you see the church at Thyatira they the warning for them was they were allowing this woman that they called Jezebel or that Jesus called Jezebel now the scholars don't believe that that was her real name but that what she was doing was similar to what Jezebel in the old testament had done and what she was what she did was she led the nation of Israel into sexual sin and idolatry and um, in fact, many scholars and other people, and even people back in that day, they called her the most, uh, the wicked, the most wicked woman in the Bible, the most wicked woman in the Bible. And so, um, 
Jesus kind of compares the church at Thyatira with this Jezebel who was leading the nation of Israel into sexual sin. And so I wanted to address this subject because I just feel like sometimes in the church it's overlooked, it's not really discussed, and um, the sad reality is, is that a lot of young people, a lot of teenagers and, and young adults, young marrieds, and, or, or people that are not married yet, they're in the church and they're not hearing truths. And so they're getting, they're getting their ideas and they're forming their opinions based on peer pressure, based, based on the world, based on you know, what their friends outside of the church believe. And that's what they're doing. And so they're actually engaged in um, a lot of sexual impurity. And I just think that it's so vital, it's so vital that we uh, talk about it and that we discuss it because this is a topic that that I don't I don't even think that we quite understand the ramifications and the consequences and what the Bible has to say about sexual immorality. So I'm just going to jump right in. And um, first of all, I just I I have to set the stage. So I'm setting the stage right now. So here's the bottom line. Here is the foundation of sex. Sex is God's design. God instituted sex. It is his institution. He, he is, it's his thoughts. It's, it's the way that he designed us. But here's the thing. It is designed for a specific purpose. And we find that in Genesis 2.24 that it goes all the way back to the beginning to Adam and Eve and it says this this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife joined means intimacy and the two are united into one and then Jesus reiterates these exact words when he's talking about the family in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 31 he actually quotes these verse, these words from Genesis chapter two. So, because sex is God's design, He alone, He alone, um, can define the parameters of it. He alone for its use, for its use. So here's the thing: sex was designed between a man and a woman. Um, inside, inside the bounds of marriage, okay? So anything, any expression of sex outside of that, outside of those parameters con constitutes abuse of God's gifts. Abuse of God's gifts. So abuse, now listen to this. Abuse in the use of people or things in ways they were not designed to be used is called sin. So anything outside of that, anything outside that, like, like look at a man and a woman married together and around them is this brick wall, okay? And so everything that God designed is for inside that brick wall. Anything that is not of that is outside the parameters that God set down. And that is, includes, and it's not limited to, adultery, premarital sex, pornography, and sexual relation, uh, homosexual relations, and everything that includes, whatever that includes. And I mean, you know, we know that it's, 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 it's just become crazy these days. All of those things are outside of God's design outside of God's design. So why am I tackling this issue tonight? An issue that is clear in scripture. It's clear, it's not even a gray issue, but it is black and white in scripture. Why am I tackling it? Well, first of all, because there's a message that's being preached and that many believers are falling for. And that message is this, 
that all it's it's an all inclusive message that's being proclaimed so in other words it's like God loves everyone and accepts everyone okay so we're going to touch on that in in just a little bit okay so there's an all inclusive message that's being proclaimed in the world and the church has begun to adopt it um I believe that the church is ignoring it and that young people are ignorant and when I say ignorant I don't mean stupid I just mean young people today they're ignorant of what the Bible has to say about sexual impurity and what the Bible has to say about sex they don't know how important it is um, believers are confused and many are faced with it and they're not sure what to think believe or to do and so that's why I'm tackling this message today hi Terry nice to see you okay so we're talking about the misuse of sex, the misuse of sex. And I want to remind you that the misuse of sex is not a 21st century problem by any means. In fact, it goes all the way back, all the way back to when the world was corrupt, when God decided to destroy the world, with when Noah was found righteous. And so God caused a flood to come on the earth because there was a lot of great sexual sin that was going on in that day. And then, in Gen so that was in Genesis 6, and in Genesis 19, if you remember correctly this story, there were two cities that were that were so involved in great sexual sin. I mean, homosexual relationships and all kinds of things that that I I probably don't even know that even existed back then or even exists today for that matter. But it was the cities were Sodom and Gomorrah, and um, God decided that He was going to rescue Lot. From Sodom and Gomorrah and so he sent three angels that looked that were men to into the city to rescue him and and Lot um, brought them into his house and they spent the night that night and uh, that night the men of the city came and basically tried to break down the door and um, were calling on Lot to, to bring the men out so they could have sex with them and Lot, you know, was mortified by it. In fact, he even offered his virgin daughters to these men so that, so that he didn't have to defile these men that he brought into his house as guests, these angels. And so that night, the angels actually killed the men that came to the house. So nobody, nobody had to, you know, go out there or whatever. And then God, the next day, God, uh, took Lot and his wife and his family out of that, those cities and he destroyed it with fire and brimstone. So, um, so sexual impurity or the misuse of sex has been going on all the way, all the way back to Genesis, all the way throughout the New Testament. And then you for, fast forward thousands of years, thousands of years to the New Testament. Jesus talked about it. Jesus talked about sexual immorality over and over again. Paul addressed it to the churches of Corinth because, oh my goodness, if you read if you read First and Second Corinthians, you'll see it over and over again because this church was in heavily involved in sexual impurity. He talked about it in, in Corinth, to the, to the church at Corinth, to the church at Galatia, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Colossians, to first and first Thessalonians and Jude. All of those, all of those books, Paul talked about it. It is mentioned many, multiple times in the New Testament. In the New Testament. And then, of course, when John received his revelation, the book of Revelation. Jesus gave a warning to the church at Thyatira because of their great sexual sin that was going on. So that was the first century. Fast forward to the 21st century and it is still rampant. It is still rampant and it's, it is so bad and it is prevalent in the church. It's prevalent in the church, the misuse of sex. Okay, so... Um, so that was the that was the basics. So um, let me give you first of all, 
let me just say here. So why is why is sexual impurity so bad? What what effects does it have on us? And the consequences. You know, why is it so bad? Well, let me give you a few things that the Bible has to say about it. First of all, sexual impurity when you are engaging and fully engaged in sexual impurity and it's a consistent pattern in your life, it is impossible for you to maintain a healthy intimacy with God. Now you'll hear people say, oh, well, I have a great relationship with God. Well, according to the Bible, they don't. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter four, Ephesians chapter four, verses uh, 17 through 19. It says this, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives them, gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. So when you are in, engaged in sexual impurity, it hardens your hearts and it closes your mind to the things of God. It says they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. So it's hard. You cannot have a personal relationship with God when you are actively involved in sexual impurity. And this word impurity found in Ephesians chapter 4 means it comes from the Greek word akatharsia, which means defiled, foul, ceremonially unfit, okay? And it connotes actions that render a person unfit. Now listen to this, a person is rendered unfit to enter God's presence. Those who persist in unrepentant immorality and impurity cannot come into the presence of God. That's what the Bible says. So, you know, if a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I, I, have, a, a, I have my own relationship with God. Well, I would differ on that because they, they can't hear the voice of God. Their hearts are hardened. They, their, their eyes can't see the things that we see at all. Okay, so the first thing is, is that it's impossible to maintain a healthy intimacy with God. The second thing is, is that it dishonors our body. It defiles our body. Sexual impurity does. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, um, verses 18 through 18. Um, it says, run from sexual sin, no other sin. Um, is so clearly affects the body as this one does for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body don't you realize that your body is the temple of the holy spirit who lives in you and was given to you by god you do not belong to yourself for god bought you with a high price so you must honor god with your body that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus came, before Jesus came to this earth, the temple stood as the place of, um, of where they would go and worship God. It was in Jerusalem. And so they would travel three, three times a year at least to come and for the festivals and the people that lived in Jerusalem, they were always going to the temple because that's where they could hear the voice of God. That's where they could worship God was at the temple. And the temple was to be kept sacred and holy. And if you remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem, um, the last, just before his crucifixion, and actually he did it twice, at the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry, when he walked into the temple courts, what were they doing? They were selling um, livestock. They were exchanging goods for money. And that should never have been the place for that because the, the temple was to be kept pure and holy. And Jesus was so angered by it that he overturned all their tables and he said, and he shooed them all out. And he said, this is my father's house and it is to remain my father's house and a place of prayer and a, pray, a place of holiness. And so that's what our bodies are. So when we engage in any kind 
of sexual impurity, it dishonors and it def defiles our bodies. The third one is this, sexual impurity. If you're engaged in sexual impurity, you cannot, you cannot be holy or righteous. You cannot have a, a, a holiness. And, and see, that is what we are to do right now as we're waiting for our bridegroom. What are we to be doing? We are to be keeping ourselves pure and holy because we are going to see him one day. We are going to stand in his presence. We are going to bow in his presence and worship him face to face. And, and we are to keep ourselves pure and holy. That's what the ancient Jewish uh, wives or what um, uh, girls did before their wedding. That was one of the things that they did to prepare themselves for their wedding. And you and I are to prepare ourselves for our wedding with our groom. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, it says this, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now this phrase, the kingdom of God means righteousness righteousness. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. So he's saying to us, you can't be holy and righteous. You can't keep your, your bodies pure and holy if you are engaging in sexual impurity. In fact, in Revelation 19 and, and Re 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and Revelation 19, 8 talks about the rewards that we're going to get when we get to heaven. And in Revelation 9, 8, it says that the rewards are going to be based on the righteous deeds that we did. Now, the deeds are not the service that we do or all of the works that we do. It's We're going to be rewarded for the righteous character in our lives, the holy, the purity that we um, have in our lives. That's what one of the things that we're going to be rewarded for. So that is something that we should always strive for. We should always strive for. And then number four is this. Sexual impurity comes from our flesh and causes us to walk in the flesh. It says in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. Our fleshly nature wants to do evil. It is just a normal thing for us. And it's, it's in contrast to what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. And he says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, that is the very first thing. Then he has a whole list of things that are part of our fleshly nature. So you and I have a choice. We have a choice. The choice is, are we going to follow our sinful natures, the things that we want for ourselves, the things that would maybe give us temporary pleasure? Are we going to follow those things or are we going to follow the Spirit of God? Are we going to follow the Holy Spirit? It's a choice that we make. You know, when we follow the things of, um, when we follow the things of our fleshly nature, Nothing good ever comes out of it. Listen to what James says in James 4. He said, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that wage war within you? You want what you don't have. You scheme and kill to get it. This is all what happens when you and I are following the desires of our nature, of our fleshly nature. 
You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because, because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. And that is exactly what sexual impurity is. It's just what will give you pleasure. It is what you want, not what God wants. It's selfish and prideful. In fact, I think it was John Maxwell that said the, um, the root cause of sexual impurity is pride. Think about that. The root cause of sexual impurity is pride. Is pride. So let me kind of close with some common thoughts. Some common thoughts that... Um, that people have today about sexual impurity or whatever, or just thoughts in general, um, especially those in the progressive church. Now, you know, I've talked about the progressive church and what that means and everything. And it's, it's the, it's the part of the church that is, um, they minimize the Bible. They minimize God's commands. They, um, they go more on, you know, what they, they kind of adopt, um, the Bible to fit in with the world rather than the world to fit in with the Bible. So, and I know I've said that many, many times. So this is very common and it's, it's, it's very common in the church, these things. So this is one thing that you might hear. Well, God loves and accepts everyone. God loves and accepts everyone. And I would say, oh yes, he does. Oh yes, he does. He loves and he accepts everyone, but he does not accept their sin. And the Bible says that anything outside the bounds of marriage between a husband and a wife is sin. Anything that goes outside that brick wall is sin. And God does not accept the sin. Do you remember the woman that was caught in adultery in John chapter 8? When they brought her before Jesus and they were, they were ready to stone her. They were ready to kill her because, of course, the law in Moses said that, that a woman caught in adultery was to be stoned. But Jesus saw her heart. And so he bent down and wrote something in the sand. We don't know what it was. And, and then all of a sudden, one by one, they all left. And Jesus got back up to his feet and he looked her in the face and he said, Woman, where have all your accusers gone? Is there no one here left to accuse you? And she said, no one, sir. And he said, neither do I. And then what he said next is so important. Go and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more, he said. Go and sin no more. He's not given her permission to go and live the way that she once lived. He's setting her free. And, he, and, you know, and sexual impurity is not a sin and sin is bondage, bondage. You know, you and I can never have joy, never have peace, the fullness of joy, the fullness of peace. We can never be free in our life if we are controlled by sin or if we're controlled by our sinful fleshly nature. Do you remember the woman at the well? Jesus came into town that day in Samaria and this woman came to gather water and Jesus began this conversation with her and, and, and shortly within the conversation, he exposed her sin right there. He said, you have had five husbands and the man that you're living with now is not your husband. In that day, she was considered a prostitute, a prostitute. And Jesus sat right there and offered her living water. And he didn't give her permission to go back and continue her lifestyle, but he gave her what would change her, what would make her fulfilled and content. But so she, want, she wouldn't be looking in all the wrong places for that because none of that, it's a temporary fix. It's a temporary pleasure that is gone in just a second. In just a second. Okay, so God does love and accept everyone, but he does not accept their sin. Number two, you might hear this. Well, God believes in love. I would say, oh, yes, he does. He believes in love so much. Why do you think he created marriage? Why do you think he created a, um, a husband and wife together and, 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 and intimacy between them? Because he believes in love, but... God has also set down parameters that you and I are to abide by, that you and I are to abide by. 
And number three is this. Well, times have changed. What was considered wrong in the Bible times is no longer considered sin. That's what a lot of people really do think. Well, let me read you what it says in Malachi, in Malachi chapter three, um, verse six. It says, I am the Lord and I do not change. I am the Lord and I do not change. Hebrews 13, 6 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Numbers 23, listen to what this says. In Numbers 23, verse 19, it says this, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not a human, so he does not change his mind. God does not change his mind. The same God that wrote the, the Bible, that wrote the, the, the parameters to marriage, does not change. He doesn't change. He doesn't change because the culture changes. No. I mean, we might change in the church. We might change our programs and things in our church to, to fit in with the culture. That's okay. But if you're going to change, you can, you can never change doctrine or theology. What God said, it's still, it's still, um, it's still true today. It's still true today. So I would disagree with that. Yes, times have changed, but what was considered wrong in the Bible is still wrong today. Number four is this. I can still have a relationship with God because he understands. Well, we already talked about that, that you can't really have, you cannot have a relationship with God because, because it, it hardens your heart and it, closes your eyes to the things of God. But listen to what it says in Proverbs 28, verse 9. It says, now listen carefully, Proverbs 28, 9. You might want to write this verse down. God detests the prayers of a person who ignores the law. Did you hear that? God detests the prayers of the person who ignores the law. So if you're ignoring his commands and you're ignoring the parameters that he set down for your own benefit, for your own selfish benefit, well, God's not going to hear your prayers. Now, he will hear a repentant prayer. He will hear the prayer that says, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry, and I ask you to forgive me. Of course he hears those prayers, but he's not going to hear the other prayers. He's not going to hear the other prayers. In 1 John, I'll read you this, um, this, this verse too. 1 John 2, verses 3 to 4. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commands. We can know him if we obey his commands. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commands, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth and not living in the truth. So the only, the, the only people that can truly have a relationship with God, the only people are the ones that are following the commands of God. And number five, we might hear this. But I'm not. But I'm not doing it. Um, but I'm. Ex but I. I have. I'm accepting it for such and such a reason. Maybe we don't want to lose somebody in our family, or we're. You know, we're afraid of losing this relationship, or we're afraid of someone. You know, we're just afraid of the backlash or whatever. Well, you know, James four seventeen says, and this is so important for us to remember. I didn't mark this one. James 4, 17, and I can probably quote it by memory, but it says this. It says, remember, it is sin to know God, what you ought to know what you ought to do and then not do it. It is sin. It is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And then in Revelation 1, be, um, the, the end of this passage from 28 to 32, it says that those who accept it are just as guilty as those who are doing it. So we have to be very, very careful. Finally, in Ephesians chapter 5, listen to what this says. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, it says, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. So he talked about sexual immorality. He says, there should be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. 
So sexual sin, this is what it does. It destroys families, relationships with people, and it destroys your relationship with God. It destroys your self-worth, your integrity, and your reputation if people find out about it. So that's what sexual sin does. But here is the good news. And I love to close with good news. The good news is this, that God is a forgiving God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if, anyone, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So when you confess your sins before God, he takes all that defilement, all that stuff that's in you, he takes it away and wipes the slate clean. He gladly accepts our repentance when we choose him over our flesh. He will restore us, especially in fellowship with him. Isn't that so awesome? So does he hold? Does he hold a sinful heart? Does he hold your sinful um, or your, your sinfulness, your, your sinful repentant heart against us? No, no, no. He does not hold it against us. If anybody can show us that by example, it would be the Apostle Paul. He was a destroyer of the Christians. He was a, a man filled with anger and hatred. He was a man that, that was, had, had a vendetta against God and God's people, and the Christians. And, and then when he repented, everything changed for him. God wiped him clean and God used him for the great purposes. So has... Saul or Paul ever been held accountable since then? No way, because he was a changed person. So you and I, we can we can have that that um, all that unrighteousness taken away. All we have to do is go to him and ask him to forgive us. So um, I really just wanted to share this topic with you tonight because I think it is so important that we know this. Thank you so much, Alta Gracia. Thanks, Jan. I appreciate that. And um, I pray that you will share this video with others. Um, I, I really do pray that you'll share this with others because somebody needs to hear this message. Somebody that may be dealing with someone in their family, a child, a, a, a sibling, a a friend or something and they don't know what to say they don't know what they believe they're confused because they haven't really been taught um, you know what the Bible has to say about this and we I don't I honestly don't think that we really understand the repercussions and the consequences to to sexual sin and sometimes we don't even see it and one of the things and, and I and I mentioned this at the beginning of my message one of the things that is still considered sexual sin is premarital sex and and you know you we can tell we can teach our young people our kids our grandkids we can teach them listen that is not god's ways god wants you to save your person for, save yourself for the for the, your spouse when you're married and you can do it others have done it many have done it you can do it too and um, and what a what a um, encouragement that is, especially if they do wait, because then the relationship that they have with each other is even more precious because God honors that. So um, share this video and thank you for joining me tonight. And um, please tell me what you're thinking. Um, share your thoughts. Maybe um, add something to it if you want to add to it or whatever. And um, and then I'll respond to all of them. And I hope that you'll read through the comments too. So um, anyways, thank you again. And I won't be on next week because my sister's going to be in town. So I'll send that message out. But thank you and have a wonderful week. Bye.